Okay, this blog I'm going to talk about cows and their calcium. Apologies for shadows and different things on the whiteboard. Um, this is my second time actually doing it. This is, okay, this is a lot of writing on the board. Uh, this is a longer one, it's complicated. And I've already had to have a shot at it already when I didn't press record. So this is this time or two, so you'll see some writing on it. Anyway, you came here to listen about calcium. Really important mineral in our spring calving systems. Really important mineral for the dairy cow, uh, regardless of your, whether it's spring or autumn or all year round. And if you look at the cow when she calves, she's a massive transition uh, from no milk production to interlactation cycle. Standing start, like these couch to 5Ks, but in so, sort of a window of 24 hours. And really negative energy, body condition, protein, all that energy management is really critical around calving. But the next big one for me and the next big thing to get right for the cow is calcium, particularly in spring-based systems, in grass-based systems. I find it's, it can be a problem. So we all know about calcium or you've heard of calcium in relation to clinical milk fever. And that's important because calcium, I suppose it's, it's involved in muscle function. It has other roles as well. But you know, that's why we see when it bottoms out at a very low level. And, you know, I, I have a lot of vets that, that, that follow these. And you know, these are the levels we talk about in millimoles per litre, 1.5 or below. Uh, for uh, clinical milk fever and subclinical is 2.1 millimoles if you are blood testing but so calcium you know the obvious clinical milk fever the muscle weakness down she can be down collapsed she can be tremory cold and um, you know so we know about clinical milk fevers but really the important thing to understand and this is where we're you know I set a target of less than one percent uh, of clinical milk fever we're moving towards um, really understanding that it's you know when people talk about iceberg diseases and if you have one clinical milk fever you can have 10 or more subclinical cows with low blood calcium they don't seem obvious to you or they won't show clinical symptoms like your downer cow but really um this is where we need to get better at managing it so if you have an increase of uh one percent you, you you know of milk fever cases or you're getting a run of milk fever cases you really need to prioritize managing calcium we'll talk about that in a bit so that's it, that's clinical milk fever, it's iceberg disease, probably one of the key points to remember around calcium. So sorry about all the scribbling here, um, that was my last recording. So coming up to calving, why is calcium a challenge for the cow? Well milk is full of calcium, it's one of our unique selling points for milk as a quality uh, animal protein. Um, just one of many and calving time uh, she even before calving time she's brewing colostrum and her other so there's a massive demand for calcium you know in the higher yielding cow it can even be bigger demand for calcium she can't naturally pull it from her diet so she's a very unique system which I'm going to talk about and you've heard me talk about before which flushes calcium from the osteoclast in the bone into her bloodstream and that's a really unique system. It's really important, even though it's a little bit complicated, to get our heads around that because particularly in a spring-based system, there's some challenges. So she has that increase in calcium demand. She can't get it from her diet or a diet alone. She's got to supplement, um, and that she does that through this process here. And I've been calling it the wrong cycle for a while. But anyway, so that's 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 why cows need more calcium around calving time. And I suppose if you really want to look at an important thing is, uh, so we have our clinical milk fever, and then we've our subclinical hypercalcemia, our subclinical milk fever. And, but why is it important? What does low calcium actually do to the cow? So muscle function is quite obvious, muscle nerve function, that's where we get our downer cow, um, our collapsed cow. Um, but it also reduces white blood cells. And you think about it, the cow, she comes up to calving, massive metabolic strain, um, huge oxidative responses going on in her body as she cleans, gets ready to eat, produce all this milk. White blood cells and immunity are really important. So low white blood cell function is another challenge for the cow around calving time. So those two things, we think about them. First of all, if we focus on the weak muscles, mobility obviously is the first thing, um, but there's a lot of smooth muscles in the body of the cow. The rumen, that big engine of the cow. Um, the uterus is a muscle. Think about that. So think about the, if you're getting slow calvings. I've seen it in heifers. No clinical milk fever, but they had slow calvings um, because of subclinical hypercalcemia. And it was back to the diet pre-calving that had some issues in it. Um, so the teeth sphincter, the, the end of the teeth in the cow, that's a muscle, like a gait, the mechanical defense. If that's weakened, you could see more mastitis. Uh, really important if you think about a flabby, weak muscle in the room and dry matter intake. What do we want that cow to do? We want her to eat, eat, eat until she can match her energy demand. So really important for the freshly calved cow. Displaced stomachs, displaced abomasums, that stomach sits underneath the big 
room and uh, and you forget that displacing one of the one of the things you need to look at is, is milk fever an issue so even right or left displacement so our left or our slow or chronic but the right acute cases can be linked to milk fever and um, so slow calvings think about the uterus as well she's got to calve the cow she's got to propulse out that cleaning or placenta after and then you know the, the womb is a is a dirty place post calving is bacteria there but naturally if she can involute that other and the white blood cells can come in you you, you know you we, we get less risk of metritis so you know if we've less white blood cells if we less muscle function we might see more issues with womb infections and that's why calcium uh, plays a role but if you think about you know if we've more metritis or dirty wounds, we've less dry matter intake. So this is all tied together. So really managing these things, and this is something I learned as a vet a long time ago, that if I didn't understand the processes of the metabolic processes of the cow, um, I'd always be treating the infections and the disease, but it's going back to see why. And if you know, why is calcium, you need to manage it. Okay, sorry about the scribbles here, but this is take two. What, why is this important? Why is... Uh, she can't get enough calcium from her diet, but she has this unique process. Uh, why is it important? Because there's different minerals play a role in this flushing process. So she pulls a lot of her calcium from her bone. She has uh, vitamin D uh, receptors in the kidneys, which help with gut absorption. A parathyroid hormone helps with that calcium release. But there's some very important minerals here, and magnesium actually plays a role here in very simple terms, and that's flushing of calcium out of the, of the system. And that's why we, a lot of farmers in Ireland understand in our spring-based systems why we feed magnesium to the pre-calving cow uh, and the role that that plays. It's actually involved in that calcium cycle. Um, and it's further complicated by potassium, which locks up magnesium. Okay, so understanding this cycle is important because <coughs> it'll affect our management process, our managing of calcium. So I've done a lot of things about, okay, why is calcium an issue? And um, this is the process. In our spring-based systems, if magnesium is fed, it's important. But one of our other challenges in spring-based grass systems where grass or silage can be high in potassium, because slurry is high in potassium. And that locks up magnesium. This is my first time doing this. Locks up magnesium. So we need to understand that process. So if we can get a handle on this, we can really get better at managing calcium. So if I look at the times to be managing calcium, what can we do? We're probably here now, so uh, are certainly here in a lot of farms. You know, why I always push for forage analysis of dry cow uh, silage, particularly uh, to look at what are the risks, if there is high potassium, if there is low magnesium, if, there's, if the decad is out, what can we do to make difference for our dry cow? And that's planning ahead. And that's really, uh, I think, the start of good dry cow management is you know mineral feed analysis and energy and protein analysis to see what the quality is because if we can get this period of the cow's life right this transition either side of calving we can really make a difference to to how she performs in her lactation okay so forage analysis and um, so you know everyone would be aware of you know if you've got milk fever injectable calcium works very well when cows are down sometimes your vet will administer it intravenously um, but we must remember that intravenous calcium is a spike of calcium and where it's good for the cow down in the clinical case which we actually don't want to see too many of because we're in real trouble if we are and um, it should never be used as a management tool for milk fever um, it should never be used as your control for milk fever so even standing cows you're worried about if you give uh, injectable calcium because it spikes up so high um, it shoots down quite quickly while that works for the cow down and um, it's really it's not a control program so people are telling me they manage calcium and injectable calcium we need to move away from that oral calcium a lot of people talk about oral boluses oral drenching and it's a flush of calcium up for, for cows right in around calving never give an oral bolus to a cow that's down with milk fever her weak smooth muscles in her esophagus she can choke on it um, but very effective for at-risk cows so cows that are standing up that you might be at risk so you know no matter how well we manage the diet some farms because uh, some breeds like uh, guernsey and jerseys with the vitamin d receptors in their kidneys would be lower their, their age, some animals, their age, so older cows are less able to pull out, less osteoclasts, less able to pull out that calcium and yield. The more milk is there, the more calcium is there. So, so in certain farms, oral calcium supplementation around the point of calving time, you have picked out your couple of at-risk ladies, you know, it might be part of management. Some farms don't need to use them at all to get dietary management correct, but on some farms, and, and definitely body condition score I should have added there in, because if you have heavier over, 
over conditioned cows are poor at pulling calcium from the diet or, or, or uh, so right so oral calcium has a role to play in those problem cows but never give it to the down cow injectable calcium is really for these cases where we don't want to be seeing a lot of them and um, a lot of farmers will be aware about feeding magnesium the dry cow diet it's important and this is why i've got into this flushing system as i call it and i've called it the wrong cycle recently actually for a long time but mm -hmm. yeah magnesium plays a key role with the parathyroid the kidney helping that process of flushing out calcium into the bone. So if we can get magnesium high in a pre-calving diet, actually if we can keep calcium low, because if we have low, if we have a high calcium diet coming up to calving, it's almost telling this system here, this important system, we don't need to panic, we don't need the calcium from the bone. So you need a low calcium diet, high magnesium diet, and in our Irish systems, we've got to watch out for potassium because potassium directly affects magnesium. So we talk about 0.4% of dry matter intake. What does that even mean? So dry matter intake is about 10 kilos, it would be average for a lot of our cows, and 0.4% of that is 40 grams. So that's why we use that 40 grams per cow, uh, per cow per day pre-calving. But remember, um, the quality of the magnesium, the type of magnesium, and also if there's a high potassium in that silage, coming back for your mineral analysis, you may need to up that. And again, um, if you have the ability to do that uh, at calving time or if you're changing silage, it's very, it's, it's very good. So we can put magnesium through water, we can put magnesium through uh, meal, we can put magnesium through minerals. But if we can get that right, we can really help in a lot of our spring-based systems uh, reduce the risk of subclinical hypercalcemia. People will hear about decab as well and these anionic salts. I've used them as well. I found them again in higher yielding herds, probably something that I'd go back to where the cow is under even more pressure and I would do the urine pH is looking at the acidity of uh, rumen, uh, urine pH and rumen pH and looking at creating a metabolic acidosis pre-calving um, with these anionic salts and there's formulas to do that um, and they can be used as well. Most farms will, will work well with good magnesium management once they've looked at all the risks. Some farms will use the, the anionic salts. Uh, some, now we're talking about these calcium binders going into cows, so she's a very low, almost zero, less than 20 grams of calcium in the diet pre-calving. It's very difficult to achieve, um, so, but it, you, know, you will hear about that as well. So I suppose it's, to me, the, the best management of is, is looking at what, where you are, how much milk fever you get, trying to keep it at a very, very minimal level to zero, and then managing subclinical hypercalcemia by making sure that we're getting these dietary management right at risk cows then may require oral calcium. Um, so that's to me is, is good management. But the key thing is you need help with this stuff if, if you're struggling with it. Um, I would have spent a bit of time with farms there over the last week kind of looking at what we've done in the past. And really one of the areas that some of them had done really well on was calcium management. We got that down and uh, we spent a bit of time working on it. So, so that's it, that's kind of calcium. Um, overly complicated possibly. I probably I will never put as much stuff onto uh, a whiteboard again, but it really is important to remember. It's probably one of the second most important things for the cow around transition after energy management, product management. We don't want to be seeing clinical milk fever. We're losing if we're seeing a lot of cases of that. The cow has a massive demand for calcium. What well, really calcium plays a key role in muscle and white blood cell function. There's a range of muscles she needs to get to have an effective start to her lactation. Those white cells are critical for immunity. There are certain risks that are there. We need to understand that this natural flushing of calcium from the bone is complicated in our Irish system. Magnesium and potassium play a key role. When we look at calcium management there's some very short-term stuff we can do for the downer cow to more long-term control strategies that you can even adjust while during calving if you're getting a run i always go back to the dry cow diet and see what we can do there so that's it that's calcium management 101 apologies for all the, the drawing um, and a bit of rambling maybe uh, and that's calcium today um, and i think look covered very comprehensively really important minerals to get right